A very good morning to one and all gathered here. Myself, Assistant Professor from Department of Physics, is privileged to handle today's session. On behalf of St. Gis College of Applied Science, I wholeheartedly welcome you on the national webinar series, India's Economic Reforms, A Boon or Bane. As Department of Gis College to commemorate the 30th anniversary of India's economic reforms. Eminent resource persons shall be sharing their ideas and views in this video. 17 esteemed speakers for the upcoming sessions are Dr. K.G. Joseph, Director, Tati Institute of Foundation, Government of Kerala, Mr. Murili Ramakrishnan, South India Bank, Mr. V.K. Matthews, Chairman. Mr. Monting Singh Aluwal, economist, former deputy chairman, in commission government. As part of the webinar series, along with institutions, virtual national commission for students, this is now will be the session session after the keynote english chat zoom or youtube the address post Further, looking for feedback form shared participants first to the session. Now, A.K. John, Principal, Sikhis College of Applied Sciences, for the welcome address. Respected Dr. K.J. Joseph, Director, Gulati Institute of Finance and Taxation, Government of Kerala. Director, Zingit's Group of Professional Institutions, Mr. Thomas T. John. Our Chairman, Engineer Punus George. Associate Director, Professor M.C. Joseph. Chief Coordinator of the Program, Professor Anu Sakaria. General Convener of the Program, HOD of the Department of Corporate Economics, Ms. Resmi Susan Jacob, faculty colleagues, HODs, deans, and professors from various parts of the country, and student participants from different states of, Kerala, of India. A very good morning to all of you. So this is the third session of the national webinar series on India's economic reforms. The economic reforms that we started in 1991, 1 July, had its impact on industrial changes or industrial policy, financial institutions, capital market, balance of payments, trade policy, fiscal reforms, and the like. The first policy change was reflected in the industrial policy resolution. We followed a restrictive licensed industrial policy based on the industrial policy resolution of 1956. Of course, it was at the aftermath of the general industrial policy Resolution of 1948. So 1948 and 1956 
ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയൽ പോളിസി റെസൊല്യൂഷൻസ് സെർവ് ആസ് ദ റോഡ് മാപ്പ് ഓഫ് ദി ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയൽ ഡെവലപ്മെന്റ് ഇൻ ദ കൺട്രി ടിൽ നയൻറ്റീൻ നയൻറ്റി വൺ വി ഹാഡ് എ പബ്ലിക് സെക്ടർ ഡോമിനേറ്റഡ് ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയൽ സെക്ടർ ഇൻ ദ കൺട്രി ബട്ട് വി ഡിസൈഡ് ടു ഓപ്പൺ ഓഫ് ദി ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയൽ സെക്ടർ ലിബറലൈസ് ദി ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയൽ സെക്ടർ globalize the industrial sector significant changes have been made since 1991 we remember the industrial policy announced by professor pj kurian of our state in the parliament now dr k j joseph will speak on the progress of india especially in the industrial sector a word about dr kg joseph he had his undergraduate studies from st birkman's college changanasheri thereafter he moved to john mathai center for his masters he won masters with the gold medal first rank with gold medal he pursued his um, mphil and phd in jawaharlal nehru university and he was lucky enough in getting fourth foundation scholarship for pursuing postdoctoral research in the prestigious yale university in connecticut usa where he was able to get acquaintance with the eminent professors like uh, richard r nelson who is well known among the development economics as um, as the spokesman of the um, what do you call the development pro- pro- problems and uh, and issues in the underdeveloped countries he had also got acquaintance with uh, james tobin was responsible for the portfolio balance theory when he returned to india he was appointed professor in the center for development studies prashant nagar ullur now he is the chairman of globalix he is he is an advisor to even conference on trade and um, development untart he is an advisor to imf wto and similar world organizations i am extremely happy sir to invite you to this webinar session to share your thoughts and views on the industrial progress or industrial development since the launching of the economic reforms of 1991 we welcome our director sri thomas t john who is a motivating force behind st gids group of professional institutions including st gids college of applied sciences he is constantly motivating and supporting the department of corporate economics and he is of the view that the department of corporate economics has to develop in the model of the madras school of economics or the chicago school of economics in the years to come and um, we are extremely happy to welcome you sir to this meeting we welcome our executive chairman engineer punus george deans professors and extremely happy to welcome our associate professor professor mc joseph we also welcome our faculty colleagues who have joined from various parts of the country also we welcome sincerely all the students who have been participating from various parts of the country thank you may god bless you thank you sir for the warm welcome now we take this opportunity to invite our speaker for the day dr k j joseph director gulati institute of finance and taxation government of kerala for the keynote address on economic reforms and its impact on indian industries so please thank you very much esteemed members of the management committee of st gids college faculty colleagues especially 
my beloved students. To begin with, I must place on record my appreciation to the management of uh, St. Gibbs College for organizing this series of seminars or webinar series on an issue of much contemporary relevance, not only for India, in my view, for the whole developing world. In a sense that this is indicative of the proactiveness of the management and especially the principal and his colleagues in making their students acquaint with the recent developments and linking their classrooms and teachings to the reality that we live in. Along with my appreciation, I must also thank them for inviting me to be one of the speakers. Normally, I'm not a very uh, attentive person because I like talking. But today, the situation is slightly different because the two speakers who spoke before me, both of whom I keep in very high esteem and both of them are in fact, uh, in a sense, my mentors or in a sense, my elder brother. And uh, to, to, to begin with uh, Sri Jairam Ramesh, I met him in 1986. Since then, he has been very, we have been keeping a very close personal and professional relationship. In fact, I was, uh, in 1987, I saw a note which he prepared while he was an OST in Planning Commission to be given to next, then member Planning Commission, uh, um, Abid Hussain, a draft of a new industrial policy. And later, I know pretty well that he was in the midst or he was, has a ringside view of how India's economic reforms evolved. But when he spoke, when he delivered his lecture, I thought his modesty was at speak and he never ever indicated any of his role in the whole process. And uh, coming to Dr. Thomas Isaac, Professor Thomas Isaac, who was my teacher when I joined CDS for my program in 1983, Later, we became colleagues. I became, I got the opportunity to be his colleague and of course his neighbor. And later he was my boss when he was the finance minister. And in fact, uh, I feel not very confident when I am to kind of follow them. But having said this, I must say that both of them together have laid such a wonderful foundation for me to take off. In a nutshell, they said, with liberalization and globalization, you have, Jeram Ramesh said, the foreign exchange, for example, was less than a billion or 800 million. Today we are sitting on 600 billion US dollars. The stock exchange boomed beyond anyone's imagination from almost 50,000, 50 fold increase from less than 1,000 to more than 50,000. And he, of course, indicated the downside in terms of increasing inequality, which he attributed among others to the, the fact that we are born and equal. And eminently Professor T.M. Thomas Isaac built upon that and said, we had economic reforms. He put the whole thing in a historical perspective and he said, with the liberalization, your inequality increased to levels, unacceptable levels. And unemployment, the employment rate declined. Of course, growth picked up. So I must say that we are today at a crossroad. 
My job is essentially to reflect further on these issues by focusing on the industrial sector, as Professor John rightly said, because at the center stage of India's economic reforms was the industry and trade sector, not the agriculture. And uh, with these words, I would like to share with you a, uh, a PowerPoint. I will uh, try to uh, maybe finish within another 30 to 40 minutes. That's my target. As you know, Indian economists are never known for uh, keeping the target. Uh, let's see how we proceed. So I'm inclined to kind of argue the title of the, the, the session is Hastened Globalization and the Premature Deindustrialization of India. This is the title that I've given. And how we proceed from here. So I would like to begin with the argument that industry or industrialization was characterized as the escalator for the developing countries to achieve catch up. And I must also say that the presentation today, which I'm going to make is based on a number of papers, which I jointly uh, prepared with my, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kiran Kumar. And I must acknowledge because, you know, we professors always uh, free ride on our uni, our students and he also was my student, but my student, but my scholar, but I, I don't believe the fact that once a student, always a student, once a student later become friend, become colleague, that is the kind of experience that I had from my seniors. So this is what I feel. So I owe much to uh, what uh, uh, I even go to say that for, for what is good in it, I take the credit and all for what goes wrong, the, the discredit will go to Kiran. Anyway, sorry, uh, this is, okay, now, uh, to begin with, uh, I, uh, we argue that uh, yeah, well, as far as the developing countries are concerned, industry was the uh, escalator for, articulated uh, as the escalator for catch-up or uh, bringing out the necessary transformation. And if then the question we answer that, how to industrialize? What are the different kinds of strategies open to developing countries? And what was India's approach? We saw already that, but I will be as a, as a, because they are all ministers speaking and professor doesn't have the freedom to speak like a, prof, like a minister. So I will have to be uh, kind of, you know, you know, we'll have to refer to some, uh, 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 some scholars and all which I will be doing. That is, that is our style of thought, and That's what you expect from me. Then if you, I put the context that there is a great paradigm shift of, in, in India as well as the developing world. And what was the outcome with respect to industry? And we uh, explore, how to explain what we have observed. Uh, that is the kind of uh, 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 preview of the storyline which we are going to build up, okay. Now, friends, as you're all aware, with, so after the Second World War, a large number of developing countries got political independence and all of them shared the basic characteristics of any less developed country like low saving, Law investing, agrarian, illiterate, backward, unequal, et cetera, et cetera. And the key question for the policymakers of those countries, including India, was to bring about the transformation of those countries. And we had from the economists a number of uh, the, the, the central idea from them was that, you know, go, it is if you want to develop, you want, you should industrialize. Looking across the world, there was not even a single country at that time, or even today for that matter, Jeffrey Sachs says that there is, there is no country in the world which managed to achieve a per capita income of $500 by focusing on primary agriculture. That means industry was shown to be the solution. Something like we can say, either you industrialize or you perish. That was the advice. The, you know, in Adam Smith, it's, you can see the first chapter in the first book of Adam Smith, he says that he argued that the cause of improvement of the productive powers of labor, productivity that goes to division of labor and the scope for the division of labor is limited in agriculture, but it is unlimited in industry. So industry has got unlimited possibilities of productivity enhancement. Of course, without productivity enhancement, you cannot expect any prosperity. 
you have i to be to my mind Roland Rosenstein Roden perhaps he that is the inauguration of i would say the development economics uh when you're talking about the uh, east european countries he said simultaneous investment in a number of industries he didn't say simultaneous investment in coffee tea cardamom and rice and pepper he didn't say that he said simultaneous in the industries and again regnard knox talks about simultaneous investment is also saying arguing the case for of course behind that a balanced approach to development now if you go to arthur lewis for him development is nothing but the process of development or transformation is nothing but a successful transform tra successful transfer of unlimited supply or the disguisedly unemployed labor in the agriculture sector to the industrial sector the transfer of labor from agriculture to industrial sector that is the modern sector in his way where the marginal productivity is more higher marginal productivity that is that is that is development process and the, again we have as late as uh, 2014 we have uh, joseph strickness nobel prize winner and uh, greenwald says industrial sector is likely to be more innovative with more important spillovers to the other sectors than say agriculture i can this same thing i can go back to adam smith when he says the case of a boy who had to do a, a, a same job every day and he got bored and he wanted to play with his uh, uh, fellow boys friends and he found a way of uh, 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 you know doing that job that is when the division of labor again leading to innovation now this could be attributed to the focus on industry could be attributed to the very basic nature of industrial goods in terms of the income elasticity for example in case of agriculture you know the agriculture products when your income increases your demand may not increase so naturally the related argument is the export pessimism argument and you know that uh, the 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 linkage the, uh, according to albert hirschman the hirschman the linkage is higher and the possibilities of the science science base the, the knowledge base the physical chemical mechanical the knowledge base is much much higher in agri in industry as compared to agriculture and above all the keynesian type demand uh, possibility demand uh, multiplier effect is much more in agriculture much more in industry as compared to agriculture hence the the dictum given to the developing countries by the development economies was that either you industrialize or you perish now the question is okay having decided to industrialize the question is how to industrialize what is the what is the, what should be your trajectory what is your what is your way for how to do it get the job, job done there are two strategies open to the planners at that time uh, broadly one is the state led industrialization it is also called import substituting industrialization this state led industrialization import substituting industrialization essentially comes with a package means the state playing an important role in terms of deciding what to produce how to produce where to produce for whom to produce the state take a decision that is good implemented through industrial licensing regulations in terms of export or import or in terms of investment in terms of fdi in terms of restriction on technology so on and so forth that is the essence of import substituting strategy on the other hand we have the market led strategy essentially drawing from adam smith essentially saying that or the lazy fair theory is saying that the best government is that government that governs the least and you leave the things to market market will do the job and the emphasis is not on public sector but on private sector there is no licensing but it's left to the demand and supply and the market and so on and so forth not so much on the import substitution capacity capacity building you the world is your opportunity because others will so told that division of labor is limited by the extent of market if you want to exploit the the true benefit of division of labor you should have the possibility of exploiting your uh, uh, world market uh, that is the export oriented strategy and of course for reasons which is quite common to all which is understandable to all of us at that time the policy makers the widely preferred strategy in the early 50s 1950s or the post world war period was of an import substituting strategy because particularly the 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 hard days of of great depression which is brought about by the market oriented the, the market driven development strategy was very fresh in the minds of the development planners and also they also had the colonial experience which 
and also the experience of Soviet United Union of Soviet Socialist Republic at that time, USSR, was recording remarkable uh, industrial and other growth performance through the merge, through the through the through the uh, uh, planning process. So there was generally a, a, a kind of an approach towards import substituting or state-led development strategy. And as a result, in 1950, the share of manufacturing of a sample of 29 largest developing countries was only 11%. Following this import substitute strategy, by 1980, the average share of manufacturing in these developing countries increased to 20%, according to Adam Smith's study. Now, coming to Indian case, so for example, you know that yesterday Professor Isaac was telling you that India inherited a kind, you know, that kind of an economy that we have inherited. And it was growing at a rate of 1%. The GDP growth was 1% and per capita growth was half of percent uh, during the post-1900 period. And we are all aware that at the time, the depth, at the time of the almost the end of the last years of the Mughal Empire, almost going by the Madison data, something like 17, uh, 1700, India accounted for almost 25% of the global manufacturing output. And by 1900, and, uh, uh, the share has uh, declined to 2%. And the question is, was one of how to, how to, how to raise uh, the, 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 the share of, uh, to transform this economy. And we went and, uh, and, and we have followed the global bandwagon of import substituting policies that in turn led to, you know, that would manifest in the Mahal Nabis model, industrial policy resolution of 19, 1956 and uh, science policy resolution 56 and so on and so forth. And, 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 and we have created an institutional architecture to promote public sector led, small scale oriented, regionally balanced, and while at the same time upholding our idea of establishing a socialistic pattern of society in the directive principles of the of, of state policy. And we have, as a result of that, we have got monopoly restrictive trade practices coming in 1967. Then we have to, to, to establish our self reliance Of course, we were much more open and liberal to the foreign companies in the early years of planning. Later, with the experience of the uh, multinational companies in terms of bringing outdated technology and kind of uh, transfer pricing, we have uh, restrict. We followed a restriction on them, and by 1973, we have the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. So we have the restrictive regime, and during that restrictive regime, you know that from 1951 to 65, India recorded a industrial growth of almost 7.7 percent. I'm quoting from a study by Deepak Nair. And uh, post 65 to late 70s, they did record a rate of growth, almost became half. And that is record that is shown as the period of industrial stagnation, industrial deceleration. Being a democracy, Madam Gandhi did not go for an immediate policy reform, rather, she appointed a large number of committees, Alexander Committee, Dudley Committee, Narasimhan Committee, and these committees were inquired to look into what really went wrong. We know that by late 60s itself, we have got insights from Jagadish Bhagavadi, T. N. Srinivasan and others, particularly the influential book by Jagadish Bhagavadi and Padma Deshai on industry, planning for industrialization, highlighted the, the wrong, the, the, the ill effects of uh, excessive planning and the bureaucratic controls and, uh, and, 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 and industrial license. At the same time at the global level, we have got uh, the uh, studies of Anne of Kruger, her paper in 1974 on rent seeking society and American economic review. And above all, we had the miraculous experience of unprecedented growth in the Southeast Asian tigers. Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, and the World Bank has been kind of articulating this as the magic of market. And this just the often advice. The often given advice by the multilateral organization the developing countries was that the, this is time for you. You have to get rid of the state control regime and you have to move away. Naturally, you find at a global level itself, a major, major shift in mindset and you find pendulum shifts from import substitution to export orientation, from planning to market, my dear friends. At that time itself, we had the warnings from eminent scholars 
and both I am referring to are Nobel Prize winning economists. While delivering the while receiving the Nobel Nobel, 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 Nobel Prize in 1978, Arthur Lewis declared the engine of growth should not should be technological change with international trade serving as lubricating oil and not as fuel. He continued, international trade cannot substitute for technological change. So those who depend on it as their major hope are doomed to frustration. My dear friends, this is a time for us to reflect our importance, our overt, overt emphasis on globalization and trade. Has it led to frustration? This is a time for us to reflect on that. All the more importantly, while the World Bank and other economists, World Bank economists and others were uh, highlighting the magic of wonder created by uh, uh, a mar market in South Korea, Amartya Sen in an influential paper in 19 Economic Journal in 1983, very strong, he, he declared, if this is a free market, if Korea is a free market, then you, then you can see Walras as auctioneer, surely going around with the government white paper on the one hand and whip on the other. What he was trying to argue is that it is not a free play of market. South Korea before launching into export oriented policy regime, my dear friends, have created the necessary conditions for that. Danny Rodriguez argued that in mid 60s, there was a claim, there was an argument that India should open up like Korean way. Danny Rodriguez argued that at that time, when South Korea opened up, they had a literacy rate of 74%, whereas in mid-60s, India didn't have that. So when South Korea embarked upon globalization and open door policy, they have created the necessary conditions in terms of basic competence, in terms of literacy, in terms of domestic demand based through land reform, so on and so forth. So we can say that there you can see import substitution, export orientation, not necessarily as what is called substitute in a sense, a policy continuum. So my dear friends, let us see as we have moved forward, what has been the outcome. Next, next. Okay. I talk about the paradigm shape. Uh, let's see how, what has been, uh, 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 you know, uh, when you're, when, let me, let's spend a one little one minute on, on what is called the, 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 the policy pendulum shift. There is a generally held view that in India, the reform started with the July 21 uh, uh, with our uh, uh, our uh, uh, our own uh, uh, KV Thomas, Mr. KV Thomas, placing placing he didn't present that uh, yeah, in the policy. He was he, I, I don't want to get into details. Okay, with the new uh, 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 with that July 21, 1991 was the was the inauguration of reform in India, there's a general feeling like that. I'm, 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 I beg to differ. I must say that liberalization in India was a continuous process. And we have what is called 80s, when a large number of committees were appointed by Madam Gandhi. And these committees clearly made the argument that our regulatory, regulatory regime outlived their usefulness. There was a steady movement towards from 1977 industrial policy, for example, uh, and 1980 industrial policy example, we have a slow and steady move towards removing the restrictions and uh, uh, liberalizing the economy. So we have, say, for example, this actually, been, in fact, I have my own PhD dissertation on India's, electro, India's electronics industry. It was, uh, and in fact, the 80s reforms were confined to select industries, not necessarily broad based. And this particular, the first, first changes were the first period of uh, liberalization, or I would call it internal liberalization, has been articulated by Daniel Roderick and Ramesh Subramanian as pro-business strategy. That he, in, the, in their NBR paper, they, they say that the, the national government's uh, changing orientation towards government. And they articulate as pro-business. Pro, pro and 1990s, it became pro-market. And with the WTO, I would say it became Globalization, the fruit flesh from India becoming becoming the, the first member, one of the founding members of WTO. We got into with 1995, we got into the phase of liberalized of globalization. So we can, in a sense, 
divide the development phase, the reform of the, uh, India's development into 80 to 95, uh, that is more of internal liberalization. And post 95, it is uh, WTO or, liber or globalization phase. Now, with this, let us see how to kind of, uh, what has been the outcome. Uh, now, I think as we, the economists, we are interested in terms of the growth and structural change, right? From Kusinets onwards, this is an approach that we always take. So what actually happened? We, right from the first, second five year plan onwards, we have systematically planned towards developing an industrial base, religiously following the advice given by the policy maker, by the economists. However, we aim at manufacturing but we gained in services. That is what this graph shows. You know, the share of services steadily increased from 40%, 40% in to 60%. And agriculture, the share halved from 36% to 18%. More important, the share of manufacturing value added increased to reach almost the highest level of something like 21.78% in 1995, since 1995. We had so many committees and commissions. Now we have got uh, uh, Krishnamurti Competition Council, you know, Make in India, 2012 policy, Skill in India, so many program. And government time and again declared that our target is to have 25% of the GDP coming from manufacturing, and creating an employment of 100 million from manufacturing, my dear friends, today our share is almost 60%. Not an inch has been moved upwards, if at all, only downwards. Now, look at the growth rate. We have 80 to 95%, 80 to 90, the first period, we have a growth rate of 8.74%. And this is using the data from a CLEMS database. And uh, this is, I mean, I don't want, I mean, this will take a lot of time. Now, during the second period, the growth rate is not one point high, but rather one point lower. I mean, it's something not very uh, manufacturing growth rate, not 1% high, but 1% low. Now, this is uh, actually, uh, this is, you know, these professors are known for uh, stealing from others. This is a PhD thesis which I'm evaluating. Uh, I, I was very happy with this PhD thesis. I don't. I cannot afford to reveal the name of the steward scholar, but here she followed a kind of a different period. Essentially, eighty to ninety-one. Look at the third column, eighty to ninety-one. Sorry, eighty to ninety, ninety to two thousand, two thousand, two thousand fourteen and fifteen. Three period. Eh? Let us look at this. First period, the manufacturing value added for sixteen leading industries. This is not agriculture. This is not the aggregate India. Seven point five percent. From there, it declined to four point four four percent. From there, it declined 4.29%. It's something, I mean, I, I, I was surprised to see just with the unexpected for me. Let's go to employment. What really happened? So we have here manufacturing employment growth rate. The first period, 82, sorry, the first period is shown to be jobless growth period, 80 to 90. There's a lot of literature written by Professor Kanan, uh, Nagaraj, and a lot of our friends have written about it. And it has been articulated as jobless growth, 80s period. You have a high output growth, but the recorded growth rate was 0.37% for 16 major states. And from 3.7%, dear friends, it declines to minus 0.34% in the second phase. And the third phase, the, there is still greater decline in employment from 0.57%. Yesterday, Dr. Isaac was talking about increasing unemployment, increase the, the failure to create employment. And, and, and so Jeram Ramesh was talking about increasing inequality. And without, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, let me come to the next point. Now let's come to the share of India, where does India and China stands here? You have at the state, you know, something like 0.7% uh, of the global value adding uh, manufacturing was by India in 1970, and China had something like 2.7%. And where is China standing here? Ch uh, China had something like 6% uh, or something like that. China is having almost left side is China, right side is India. China has got a share of almost 30%. India is not even 3%. 
This is the remarkable performance that we, we were able to put out. Okay, so now I'm surprised. I'm inclined to believe that in a recent paper with Dr. Kiran Kumar, we articulated that India is undergoing a kind of deindustrialization. It's not only for us to say, it is, others are also of the same view, deindustrialization. While we have been kind of articulating, we have been globalizing, we have not been building industrial capability, and there is a kind of a ladder which is shown to developing countries, and the deindustrialization according to Trajan and others, it's argued that it is not an India specific, it's a global phenomenon. For a world for the developing countries as a whole, keeping apart China apart, this is actually most of the developing countries are faced with deindustrialization and what is called the middle and the resultant middle income trap. So, what is the deindustrialization or declining share of the industry or manufacturing in the global in the, in the national GDP is something which is quite natural. We know that. Simon Kuznets and others argued that as an economy develops initially agriculture, then industry picks up and industry they decline and service sector picks up, quite natural. So we have got, we can articulate three types of industry, deindustrialization. One is positive deindustrialization. This is a normal result of any sustained growth in a fully developed and already highly developed economy uh, arising out of rapid productivity growth in manufacturing with the share of money, and this happens, when it happens in the developed countries, when the share of GDP of manufacturing reaches 30%. When it reaches 30% of the GDP, and with a per capita of $30,000, the share of manufacturing declines. This is called positive deindustrialization. There's another category of deindustrialization called premature deindustrialization. We have got Ajit Singh and others. These are, are good, much more. Ajit, the, uh, das Gupta Singh, Ajit, and, uh, Ajit Singh from Cambridge School, they argue that this happens, this is the industrialization process taking place in the developing countries at a much lower level of per capita income and at a far lower level of industrialization as compared to developed countries. Let us take the case of India. In India, we have got a per capita income not even $2,000 and our per, and GDP share is not even 20% they started declining. This is what is called premature, you can't call it a deep premature deindustrialization. In fact, there is a case like, um, uh, you know, uh, deindustrialization without industrialization. In fact, uh, Amira Puso and Subramanian and others argue that India is a typical case of deindustrialization without industrialization, while Trajan and others would argue that in case of Africa, even without manufacturing share reaching a level of 5%, even with our per capita income crossing $1,000 per capita, they are faced with the deindustrialization that is called deindustrialization without industrialization. So you, it is up to you people to discuss further. Now, the question which I want to say that as a growth and structural change people, the manner in which the employment has changed and output behave gives a clear clue towards what is the understanding, understanding the inequality that has been alluded to by my previous speakers? So I would like to say that in the case of India, we have got a booming sector, that is the service sector, which accounts for something like 60, over 60% 60 of the GDP, while the share, uh, while the share of uh, uh, GDP, share of service sector in GDP is only 45%. That essentially means that 45% of the people contribute 60% of the GDP. That means that their productivity level is pretty high. As students of economics, you know that with higher productivity, you have got higher wages and now higher income on the one hand. You have the other, we have the money. Thank you. On the other hand, we have the agriculture sector where it accounts for 40% of the, over 40% of the, of the labor force and contributes only 18% of the GDP. That means the productivity is abysmally low. The typical case of Lewis, marginal productivity becoming negative, negligible, zero or even negative. And the kind of process that Lewis are articulated in terms of successful transfer of labor to uh, uh, from backward agriculture to modern sector has not taken place. So we have on the one hand, high income sector like the service sector, on the other hand, the low productivity, low income, and we have the great equalized manufacturing sector that accounts for 12% of employment with 16% of output that is not growing. 
So this particular pattern, this is, it is here. In fact, any inquiry, the, the primary step of any inquiry to inequality, in fact, will lead us to the doorsteps of the structural, the nature and structural, nature of structural change taking place in the economy. Of course, there are wider questions. Why, uh, I mean, this is the starting point of inquiry. I don't want to get more into inequality beyond this. Now, now what, how do the question is, we have, what we have articulated so far, we articulated that, uh, with the uh, uh, liberalization, of course, I agree with my previous speakers, the growth has actually picked up. But we argued that globalization, first of all, I want to argue that the whole globalization, liberalization phase is not an India-specific India -specific, India -specific, uh, process. It is a process of a uh, South process, Southern process. In the Southern process, India, uh, uh, Indian experience is more or less in sync with most of the developing countries, except China, China, of course, we have to talk separately. I happen to have an opportunity to be in China for three years. Uh, anyway, that's a different story. That's a very separate story. Now, the point which we want to say that we have shipped the shift in policy pendulum has happened on the one hand. We found there is a, a remarkable increase in growth and that increase in growth, the internal liberalization, the pro-business liberalization, in fact, has produced higher growth rates marginally higher growth rate than the pro-market pro, pro and pro-globalization policies. And we have seen that the, the structural change that we have, that has happened is, is at the core of inequality that we see. Now, the key question for us is why, how to account for what we have observed. Now, for me, and I think you will agree with me that when you are talking about Come growth in a globalized world that quintessentially depends on your competitiveness. In an import software regime, it's very different. You have a domestic market, you can make growth. But here, if you want to be producing growth, you can produce only by building international competitiveness. Now the question is how to build this international competitiveness. I, to my, there are different strategies. I'm going to take, you can think of exchange rate, uh, manipulation, so many short. But in the long run, there is one possibility is innovation based competence building. Second is competence building through race to the bottom or focusing on low wage, low wage, low cost advantage. Now let us look at, let us look at now, sorry. When you talk about that, competence building through innovation, uh, I'm inclined to believe that long-term sustained competence is governed by the ability to innovate. Innovation in a broader sense of the term, your ability to come with a new product, your ability to come with a new process, your ability to come with a new market, your ability to come with a new organization and new institutions. So innovation in a broader sense of the term, I would say in a should be given sense. And where does it come from? This, this innovation, is a progeny of the innovation system. Innovation system, according to the global innovation system, is a concept of the global network. And according, in, according to uh, 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 global X, the innovation system refers to the, in the, the, it is a network of various actors within the economy. It's a network of various, a system means a network of various actors. In this sphere of public sector, private sector, government sector, you get so on and so forth. And there are interactions that leads to learning, that interactive learning process that leads to innovation. And this could be articulated at the level of national level. It could be articulated at the regional level, at the Kerala level. It can be articulated, articulated at the sectoral level, at the level of a particular crop or an agriculture, for industry, for a particular microelectronics or automobile, sectoral level. As I said, innovation involves a process of interactive learning among actors in the innovation system. It's a very heavily loaded sentence. I can, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to restrict, restrict myself. How interactive are we? Do we have a systemic behavior? I'll, I, I hope I'll get some time to interact on this later. We have one department doesn't know what another department does. Department does. And if, the, if, if, if you are left to yourself, 
Each Keralite or each Indian is marvelous, brilliant. If two are brought together, there are troubles. If three is there, then it's chaos. Anyway, so I don't know how, 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 how are we equipped to work in a systemic manner. Now the question is, in an economy in the current world where the knowledge is the key resource and learning is the key process, that learning can be, that knowledge can be taught in terms of scientific knowledge, which is science-based or produced through organized process, which is documented, or it can be seen in terms of synthetic knowledge, which is, can be called experience-based knowledge. Now, the question which we want to ask is, I don't want to deal here with experience-based knowledge, at least the science-based knowledge, that's what India has been focusing on. We have never ever given importance to experience-based knowledge, which uh, I hope we'll get time to discuss. But now, what, how has we fared with respect to, uh, with respect to science-based? Uh, uh, science the one indicator of that is Arani. I remember in 87, again, another note by Sri Jairam Ramesh Tabrit Hussain was saying that India should try to uh, raise our r and uh, GDP ratio to 2% during the eighth plan because China, because Korea has a 2%. My dear friends, even today, we have not even reached even half of that. While in, case, in the case of China, we have got more than 2.1% 2, 2 of the GDP of the, of the of, uh, uh, R&D expenditure is as high as 2% of the GDP in case of India as we accelerated our globalization process. What happened? Our R&D curve shows a declining trend. This is what is going. It is reaching a maximum of almost 0.8%. And there are, thereafter, it is back and it is back to square one, it is lower than the level but remained at 96 point. You know that I, in a study, we have already analyzed the foreign intensity of India versus 10 other countries in the both developing and developing. I study with the Dinesh abroad, we have observed that during 73 to 82, R&D in, R &D intensity in India, India increased by 0.4% during that period. Among the countries compared, only Brazil presented a better picture. And uh, now I don't want to get into all those details, okay. As a result of that, what really happened? The share of low tech industries, so for example, 1980, the output share of manufacturing of the high tech industry was 32%, that slowly increased, almost reached 37%, thereafter it is declined. Whereas our low tech industries declined, there are other ways it is low tech industries picked up. We are always making the claim that we are you know, Chinese, are a blue collar, we are white collar, we are great, and the share of high tech industries is declining. Now, coming to the industrial export quality index, look at the curves of different countries. We have a curve right here. This is India. It cannot go further. All the other countries are above India. So, without RD, your export quality index is one of the lowest. All the more important, you look at 2010 to 2017, 18, you can increase your export earning either by exporting more goods quantity index, or you can export high quality, high value products that can be industrial unit value index growth. You look at what is growing over the years, we are achieving high growth. I mean, of course, our export growth is nothing remarkable. I remember in 2004, when we were preparing an export oriented employment strategy for uh, India, uh, I was in uh, uh, RIS. We projected that 2015, our export will be 450 US dollar, billion US dollar. And even today it is 310, something like that. And you look at the quantum index. We, our growth in almost all the industries here, you are, Unit value index is lower than the quantum index. That means you are trying to export and get more money by exporting more, not by exporting high value, high quality products. Now, out of the 13 major commodity groups considered, the nine commodity groups, the unit value index recorded a lower growth rate as compared to the quantum index. Okay, now, so we want, we, 
so far we argue that we have been globalizing without innovation capability. Innovation capability is nothing but the essential, essential quality in terms of uh, competing in the world market. In the world, I, I think the whole history, I think, you know, maybe in, in I think only in Bible, you know, I don't know about the story of uh, David and Goliath. He was able to defeat Goliath, uh, a big man. If you want to compete in the world market, you have to build your muscles. Your knowledge, that, that muscle is your knowledge. Have you been innovative? Have you had the innovation capability? You have not. You look at China, the situation is very different. They build the capability and they have not jumped into globalization. We started liberalizing in 1980. And within 10 years, we went into, uh, of course, of internal compulsions, we went. And 15 years, we got to globalization. How we made sufficient preparation in terms of sufficient assessment in terms of where do we stand? Can we compete? Have we made an assessment on that? But on the other hand, you go to China. 78, they liberalized. 88, 98. 2003, 25 years. They don't want to have the great credibility that we are the founding member of WTO. They are not interested in that. They are interested in ensuring that their economy grows. After 25 years of, I would say, so-called pro business, they went to pro markets. I'm inclined to believe that our liberalization was a hastened one. And our strategy was based on race to bottom. Today, you know that we are very worried about the employment quantity. The person's employment has not been growing. But look at the quality of employment. It is terrible. I don't want to get into all those details. I'll get this quick number some time is getting over. You look at the share of contract workers, almost threefold decrease during this period you are referring to. I don't have the data prior to 93. It's not available. Along with meager or negligible growth in the quantity of employment, the employment that is created was not of high quality, it is more on contract basis. With increase in contract labor, what you, what you find is the share of value added in manufacturing declines. Particularly, what you find here is the share of wages steadily declined, while the manufacturing capable, value adding capability, the manufacturing generally declined. And that has been because of declining share in wages. Profit, of course, increased there. It has steadily increased. Thereafter, it is declining. This is profit share. This is the wage share. If there's steady decline, of course, in the recent years, there's an upward trend. What is more important for my dear friends to note here is the, is the how wage rate responded to labor productivity. I have the picture for all the industries here, almost the two digit industries. During the first 15 years, we have wage share remaining at 23%. As we move to second period, it became half, 12%. Share of wages in industrial value are declined from 23% to 12% half. The wage growth rate, rate of growth in real wages, that is 2.3% in the first phase, and that became one fourth of that 0.4%. Wage rate became, growth became 0.4%. And wage, labor productivity, not that labor productivity was declining like that. Wage, labor productivity was 6.88% and it was 5.92% in the second phase. Of course, there's a decline, but not in any way comparable to. So what I'm trying to say is that when you opened up your world market, when you want to build your, you have to be internationally competitive, you had what is called a strategy of competing on low wage. And low wage, low price, instead of competing on knowledge-based or innovation-based strategy, you opted for a strategy of competing on low wage or emissarizing. We have been successfully building the emissarizing competitiveness of the globalization. My dear friends, I think I must conclude. I cannot get a better call than Joseph Stiglitz. Globalization itself is neither good nor bad. 
it has the power to do enormous good and for the countries of east asia who have embraced globalization under their own terms i underline embraced globalization under their own terms and at their own pace it has been an enormous benefit i repeat globalization is neither good nor bad for those who have embraced globalization at their pace and at their terms it has been enormous benefit but for much in the world it has not brought comparable benefit for many it seems closer to an unmitigated disaster you have to find out where we stand now another point which i wanted to say these are of some of my favorite authors dani uh, okay <laughs> Uh, trade policy plays a rather asymmetric role in development an abysmal trade regime can perhaps drive a country into an economic ruin but good trade policy per se alone cannot make a poor country rich it has to be backed by a lot of homework okay don't think that by globalizing and by opening up multinational corporations and they will come and make you rich don't think that now my dear friends i would like to conclude by saying that the failure to integrate we have moved to a phase of integrated world integrated development path we fa we we failed to integrate with integrity i must strongly say we failed to integrate or globalize at our terms and at our pace and globalization was not backed by the broad based learning innovation and competence building systems our globalization was not by 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 that as a result of that globalization was a boon for those who have born capable and it was a bane for those who are yet to be made capable i am sure the government will take up this kind of make more people more competent and while the market and ultimately let's not forget why the market could produce high growth for the growth to be growth while the growth to produce development the state has to be proactive how are we being proactive i'm sure this is an answer for my young beloved students to answer thank you very much <clears throat> thank you sir we express our utmost gratitude to you sir for sharing with us your valuable insights it was delightful to listen to you as these moments were truly an investment from which we shall benefit a lot we shall now move on to the question answer session we have received quite a few questions which we shall be addressing one at a time so the first question we have received this how the trade policy reforms affected the structure of india's foreign trade okay <clears throat> i must say that when you are talking about uh, uh, liberalization being a bane or a boon i have a book with uh, dr nagesh kumar uh where it is talking about india's competitiveness of manufacturing exports international competitiveness of knowledge, of knowledge based industries in the first part of the book we are we analyze a slightly old book we analyze uh, structural change in india's uh, exports we essentially argue that notwithstanding the liberalized trade policies notwithstanding increase in the trade gdp ratio because you know that india's trade gdp ratio is even higher than china today but that trade gdp ratio has not been accompanied by exactly so state that it has not been followed by the increasing domination of knowledge intensive industry i am referring to i am referring to the goods export okay in terms of goods export this has not led to increasing export competitiveness some of the industries for example like uh, electronics for example we have become terrible net exporters in fact it is argued that india's electronics import bill is going to be even higher than our oil bill my dear friends please remember 
A country, you know, in 2000, uh, 1970, South Korea and India, South Korea had a production, if I remember correctly, 119 million uh, uh, dollars. India had a production of 110 million dollars. Within a matter of 10 years, South Korea reached to where? Because as, as Kuhn Lee and others would argue, they have reaped the window of opportunity and they're remarkably fair. And later, when it comes to China, for example, they, for their, they, they, they by, by globalizing and liberalizing and, uh, and opening up with competence, their electronics export alone is more than India's total export. Almost 500 million, almost double that of India's export. So what I'm trying to say is that with, the global, with, the, with the respect to goods, we have not been able to make a structural change in a direction that will bring domestic prosperity. That prosperity comes from, not through, as I said here, the emissizing kind of low wage kind of stuff, which should be on the high tech industries and high value products. That has not happened. Now coming to services. We know that we are actually, you know, I must say that Mr. Matthews is going to come and talk now. Okay, uh, we know that uh, um, Mr. Matthews will be coming and talking, uh, IBS. Uh, I, I, I have great, great appreciation for uh, our software uh, countries, uh, companies, and they have enormously contributed towards uh, our export training. And in fact, in fact, it, it is thanks to the remittances and software that today we are sitting on uh, sitting on 600 billion US dollar worth of foreign exchange, not because of other merchandise trade and other manufacturing export. Now, in service again, uh, I should not be deviating. The point is I have a paper with the UNU wider saying that uh, 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 IT for development and development of IT reality submit. Information communication technology or software is a capability that is unique in a developing country like India. And whether the question was open to me, whether you should be using that for making other sectors of the economy internationally productive, competitive and efficient and make them export more. Or you export software directly and make those countries, those firms in the world market more internationally competitive. You know what I mean? I, software or information technology is an input to make someone internationally competitive. And if you export that, and make your other countries in other other firms in other countries more competitive. In effect, you are working in, against your own. This is not to mean that I'm against exports, but then these are things which one should have been a little bit more confident. And in fact, a paper with uh, Ashok Parsarni, in fact, I argued that the software projects which are more domestically market oriented are much more value adding than the export oriented ones. So on the trade front, in the commodity front, there are, there are problems and even the service front. There are problems. That is the, the structural change, you know, you know, and I, I hope I answered the question at least. I would like to be brief in my answer. There's a problem. Okay, sir. So one of our participants have raised the question. The economic growth in India in the post-liberalization period is service-led. Is this growth sustainable? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. <clears throat> sustainability. Yeah, that's an interesting question. In fact, whether the growth is going to be sustainable. Uh, now, the question is: You have to, if you look at the rate of growth of um, uh, GDP, also, you will find that uh, if you look at uh, decadal wise, uh, the growth rate in the nineties was slightly, and two thousand to two thousand ten was slightly higher than. 90 to 2000. So there are signs of deceleration already started during the last 10 years. I think part of it might be because of our policy blunders. You know that. I don't want to take into those kind of things. So I would like to say that there is service sector led growth per se, there is nothing wrong. The point is that that should not be at the cost of other sectors lagging behind so much. The point is when you talk about sustainability, what is sustainability? Let us reflect on that to answer your problem. 
One is, say, for example, I would say that economic sustainability is simple growth rate continuing. That's okay. I don't, I'm not bothered about it. Okay. Growth rate. I know that today the growth report has already said that many of the countries have learned the art of cooking high growth rates. That recipe is ready now. Not a problem. Sustainability, when you talk about economic sustainability, it has to have its equity dimension coming in and also the environmental sustainability comes in. So sustainability is a much more of a complex term. So it has to be, when you talk about sustainability, you have to talk beyond simple growth rates. What I said to you is that even in terms of simple growth rates, we have started decelerating. Of course, it, under the two years' time, it may pick up. But then the point is, a sustainable growth is a growth which is characterized by a shared prosperity. If you have a service sector which is booming, wherein your software engineers are getting... Uh, uh, sorry, there's nothing in the software industry. I don't think that, okay, because uh, don't feel anything bad about that. Some segment of the people are getting very high salary, and on the other segment here in the organization, the, the, the farm sector, they get very low. You create, I would say, bad quality inequality. There are two types of inequality. I don't mind the inequality. Inequality is okay. If everybody has been lifted, and some people have lifted a little bit more inequality in this, your Guinea will be. Hi, no problem. Recently, one of my props from Brazil was saying that you Indian, you India are now competing with us on, in, on, on inequality because among the British countries, Brazil used to have the highest inequality. Now we are competing with them. I don't mind inequality in this, but now the question is the quality of the inequality. If everybody is lifted and somebody is lifted fast, no problem. But if you have a situation wherein service sector led growth leads to a situation wherein somebody is lifted too much, others are remaining where they are. That is called bad inequality. So if this is leading to that kind of bad inequality, I will not be one that promotes that. Then the problem is not with the service sector. The problem is one of you are, you, know, you also have an agriculture minister also here. Nah? It's not only that only industry minister. All ministers should do their job. So agriculture also should pick up. That's the point. The next question is, sir, do you think the Make in India or Startup India program will eliminate the problems of industrial development in India? I wish it does. I wish it does. But unfortunately, I'm not very... No, economists are never optimistic. No? You are always... It's a dismal science. And always you take with a, a spoon of salt what I say, I'm sure, because economists are learned to speak the negative things. That's very bad of us, I must say. But that's why economics is called a dismal science. So I think I think making India is a good program. Skilling India is a good program. These are all, and 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 and, and what is called in recent one, what is it called? Uh, uh, Self-reliance curve, uh, Atma Narbar Bharat. It's equally good program. Not very good. Uh, I hope you, should, you younger generation should be more optimistic. But unfortunately, our mindset is slightly not very good because I would say that Earlier days, any policy making was actually an outcome of substantial thought process backed by the analytics of that. Today, policies are based more on slogans. Make in India. Make what? Make where? Make for whom? Make how? I'm not very clear. So I don't think that these are things, I mean, it's a good idea. In fact, I think that this, this slogan based things also might work because Earlier, because you are, see, when you have, you have different paradigms, the paradigm is different now. Uh, but I am not very much, uh, very optimistic, but I still I feel that it might work. I, I want this thing to work. Thank you. So, the industrial demerger and merger policy of the corporates lead to industrial growth in the economy. What's your opinion on this, sir? <clears throat> okay. See, the point is, we have uh, and the, uh, we have the industrial licensing policy in Korea committee in the mid fifties. Now, you know, Mahalams, our great plan in 1962, I think 60, Nehru himself appointed 
Mahal Nobis to look into what is happening during inequality. Because we have talked about socialistic pattern of society. And Mahal Nobis was the first one to come for the idea that Mahal Nobis committee report said that look, inequality is increasing. I mean, it's not increasing the way we see this is what Dr. Isaac said. It increased very marginally, very minimal. Even that minimal increase was not tolerated. So the where the roots of that inequality led to the interesting licensing inquiry committee and monopoly inquiry committee, two committees later. And that led to the monopolies restricted trade practices act, MRTP, commission, etc. etc. With the liberalization, it became monopoly, the competition commission. It has now become competition that has been abolished, now competition commission. So idea is actually to promote mergers and acquisitions because essential act of fact is there is an economic rationale behind that. This will help. This will help economies of scale and scope. Small used to be, once, once upon a time, when we were young, small used to be beautiful. Small is no more beautiful. Now it is bigger is beautiful. You have to be a global scale, you have to be a global operator, larger scale of economies, all those kinds of things. So that is the underlying logic on that. Now in that process is also, in fact, quite a lot of our uh, the FDI also, in fact, we have got instead of as a result of this, we are actually getting uh, quite a lot of our FDI not in the green field route, but in the, on the brown field. If you look at why we encourage FDI kind of stuff, why do we encourage FDI? If a country is saving constraint, if an economy like India is only having 30% saving rate, and if you achieve, if you want to, if you are having a I caught today of four. The maximum growth rate that you can get is seven point something. But you are aiming at two digit growth rate. If you want to have high digit, two digit growth rate, either you decry, decrease your I core, that means you have to increase your technology. That's not easily possible. Anyway, we are not bent upon that. Another option is to increase your investment to supplement your domestic saving with the foreign saving. That is what leads to your uh, foreign investment. So this foreign investment comes in. That foreign investment, in fact, now the question is, when it takes the case of mergers and acquisitions, the key question is, the perceived advantage of uh, foreign technology, it comes to a domestic, it doesn't come to a domestic economy and doesn't create a, 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 a what is called uh, this, the, the accelerator multiplier effect that we talk about. It doesn't come because it is already buying up an existing investment. It's already taking the form of a, a brownfield investment. My, my colleague in uh, Center for Development Studies, Dr. Biena, has done sub, a, a substantial research on this, and she has shown the adverse impact of that. So what I'm trying to say that, though all these policies are there, why growth is not picking up? Because when you talk about the quantity of employees, it is not the quantity of FDA that matters, the quality of FDA that matters. If it is taking the case of mergers and acquisitions like that, the ultimate impact will be very different and it will be less optimal, uh, suboptimal as compared to other ways what we theoretically argue out. So we shall be closing the question answer session with this last question. In spite of opening up the economy, India fails to attract foreign direct investment. A major source of foreign exchange is through portfolio investment. Why? Okay, interesting question. Okay, I think uh, <clears throat> I would like to put it like this. I have an interesting paper which is read by uh, uh, Bendakil Lundwal and Dieter Ernest. Ernest is from Eastern Center, Hawaii. Point number one, in 1994, uh, uh, Jagadish, sorry, T.S. Srinivasan says, we have, I, I started telling to my students in the class, we have a very strange situation, which you have said, like countries are competing among each other to attract FDI. Not only countries, even subnational entities are competing among each other. India, Kerala is competing with Tamil Nadu. With red carpet welcome, you know, chief ministers are taking foreign tools to attract foreign investment. Now the point is, it is here the statement by Lundwal and uh, Ernest comes. As far as foreign multinational companies are multinational companies are concerned, low wage, interstate holidays, red carpet welcome, dinner with the chief minister, these are all taken for granted. 
it is all there then what they look for is what can you offer us you means developing and relocation what you can offer us to enable us fdi to survive in a fiercely competitive environment and investment get directed to such locations where the attracting country can complement the core competence that the developing the multinationals need so investment goes to those countries and regions where first of all the domestic market is a great idea and also in china for example um, but the point number point number one i want to say is that that basic core competence if you can offer that core competence is what today the modern world nothing but knowledge that is the key resource that they want that resource they will com that to complement supplement their own core competence that's what they look for they go to such areas not to dinner with the chief minister or red card per welcome subsidy and wage holiday industry these are all there we know that it's all there don't talk about that now coming to china for example for example when we opened up you know that india's automobile industry we have got suzuki okay and suzuki is thanks i mean i must say that we must be thankful to suzuki for the for the automobile industry and when suzuki okay when um, uh, volkswagen for china is suzuki for india it is volkswagen that taught china how to make automobiles and later all of those came they told you are all welcome no problem you come no problem but but when you come to china you go to a particular province and you must share your equity with the provincial government over there it is not free you when you give the share i we will give you return something return to you what in that particular province all the taxes will be by you so for example in beijing hyundai has all taxes by hyundai so what i am trying to say this is where i said you need a proactive government you should not be having a sleepy government so what what are we trying so what i am trying to say that fda has been attracted or that's not again the question is i am not bothered whether you got the attract or not even the form of investment which came was more in the form of brownfield and secondly if you are not able to attract because they don't find you sufficiently attractive okay i mean yeah that is the reason we have that that attractiveness would have also built your competitiveness so it actually if you are attractive you would have been internationally more competitive that would have also this is again a kind of i can say that uh, our vicious circle of poverty another kind of vicious vicious circle of development is coming here in fact articulate that i think this up to you people to decide thank you very much thank you sir for patiently answering all the posted queries a word of appreciation to all participants for actively participating in the session we really hope this quest answer session benefited you well and has clarified your queries may i now invite professor mc joseph associate director st kis college of applied sciences to share the concluding remarks eminent professor and director dr k j joseph sir we thank you for taking all efforts in leading today's webinar on india's economic reforms a boon or bane dr k j joseph is currently the director of gulati institute of finance and taxation he is the president of goblix which is a worldwide open and diverse community of scholars working on innovation and competence building he also served as the editor in chief of innovation and development journal he was the chair professor at center for development studies and consultants of united nations economic and social commission for asia and pacific world trade organization and united nations conference on trade and development he was the gold medalist for his ma economics from calicut university and secured phd from jawaharlal nehru university and he undertook postdoctoral research at yale university usa 
He has about 80 research papers to his credit. He has so far published six books and hope there will be more in the pipeline. When I searched Google to collect his profile, I wondered to see 42 pages about his career in the Google. Surely he is a man of dedication and hard work. It is a blessing that we got him to lead today's webinar. Following are some of the points he touched upon during his talk on the impact of economic policies on Indian industries. Industrialization is the key engine for growth and prosperity for developing countries. Industrialize or perish. Another one was simultaneous investment is in a number of industries is a necessity. Industrialization is necessary for development of agriculture. Market-led industrialization is better than state-led industrialization. Innovation involves a process of interactive learning among the actors in the innovation system. We must give importance to science-based knowledge. Agriculture that employs over 40% of the labor force generates only 18% of the GDP. Globalization is neither good nor bad, and a good trade policy alone cannot make a poor country rich. These are some of the points he has touched in his presentation. Sir, we are thankful to you for the systematic and effective presentation. We are also happy to note that you have successfully answered all the questions from our participants. May, may God Almighty bless and take care of you in the days to come. We express our sincere gratitude and warm thanks to you in person. We are also very much grateful to our dear participants. May God bless us all. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Please know that the next session of the series is on 13th August from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. It will be chaired by Mr. Murali Ramakrishnan, MD, South Indian Bank. He shall be sharing his knowledge on impact of globalization on banking sector during this session. This will be followed by sessions taken by illuminaries like Mr. V.K. Matthews and Dr. Montek Singh Alwalia on 16th and 17th respectively. As part of the webinar series, along with the knowledge sharing sessions, a virtual national level elocution competition for students has also been organized on each day of the series. The prizes for the competition are sponsored by South Indian Bank. The winner of day two elocution competition is Ms. Kirtana Shankar from MOP Vaishnav College for Women, Chennai. Congratulations, Kirtana. We have now come to an end of the third day of the national webinar series, India's Economic Reforms, A Boon or Bane. On behalf of Senghis College of Applied Sciences, I take this moment to sincerely thank each and everyone who have graced this occasion with their presence and wish all the participants enriching days of knowledge sharing and learning in the upcoming days. Thank you all for joining us here. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Have a nice day.